and make sure one last thing on Blackboard. Collaborate. Okay, it's allowed for downloads. All right. Let me blow this up a little bit bigger. Last time we did this, um, I lost the code because I got kicked out. But originally we had, if tickets, oh. something like this where we had a negative value in um, we would prompt the user to re-enter the information however this was a single pass-through how can we change this to where it will constantly keep the user there if they keep on entering an invalid yeah. data I think a while loop is one of the ways of doing it. Yes. That. How would we do that? A while. While loop. One way. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking. Um, so let's say that we're doing the ticket, right? We could pretty much have it. It's in an if statement. I guess we wouldn't. You don't have to use the if statement. I guess. I'm just trying to think of how best to put it, but. <clears throat> Hold on, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hey, someone, you want to finish up? But you're on the right track. That's one way of doing it. So we don't necessarily need this if. What well, can we change it to? Yeah, so you could just change it to while, actually. That is correct. That's one way. And then, I mean, the way that I'm kind of working on, on the lab is a little bit different. So it's instead I'm allowing them, I'm moving that statement there, uh, the C uh, out statement above the while loop. And then I'm allowing them to enter the C out and the C in before the while loop. And then if it's not correct, if it doesn't fall in the correct range here that we've, the expression that we wrote, then I'm telling them that they need to enter a number between X and X with a C in underneath it, kind of like the book shows. Okay. But I mean, we can just simply do it. There's multiple ways of doing it. Don't get me wrong. We could have we could have done this in a, instead of a while loop. We could have done it in a do while. But this is one way. But there's. I just want to be. I want to be clear. There's more than one way of doing it. So in this case, if I enter negative, it keeps me there until I enter a good value. So let me copy this. What if you enter a letter? Do what? Hmm. What I'm working on in the lab. Uh, run it again and enter a letter instead of a number. Yeah, it would. It might break if you enter a letter. Oh yeah. I think it runs into like an in infinite loop. Mind it earlier at least. Well, we're not testing on bad data with characters yet. Okay. That's chapter 10. When you okay, have, so I don't need to fix that yet. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't won't need to, to fix that when it comes to bad data, when it comes to characters. That's later on in when you cover chapter 10. So do not worry about that. So I'll fix this up later because I lost it. For right now, we have everything um, going to the screen. What happens, what would happen, how would we do it if we want this information that we put right here to go to a file? 
how would we be able to do that? How would we information right here? We show for this for your lab that you have to do your lab three. There should be nothing going to the screen, maybe except saying, "Hey, file been generated." But how can I get this information to go to a file? Well, I guess called revenue.txt. You have to open the file first. It'd be or have the user generate the file name. And then outfile dot open that file name. Well, hold on before I go outfile. Don't I have to create an object first? Yes. But before I do that, don't I need something else? I have to define the variable. Well, first, <coughs> I do that. Don't I need yeah. the processor? Yeah, it's going to be um, oh, what was it? F something F uh, F stream, I think. Go for there. I can do create, then I create my variable. What which type is it? It's a user input variable. Um, probably gonna use a string, right? Yeah, string file name. Of stream. Uh, hey, hello. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I was going to say um that today I have to um today I can't be on for the, like the entire session today because but um is this going is this recorded right? Yes, you can download it. You will be able to download it. Yes, it is being recorded. All right. I was saying that because I was like just wanted to get on quickly and tell you that I that I'm not gonna be on today. So. No, that's fine. That's why I record them so you can download them and watch them later. No, I um as soon as I also um joined barely joined uh, because just to say this like I said um and it started apparently at seven instead of six thirty. Yes, since uh, well originally I was going to delay it, but since came on at seven, so they decided to go ahead and let's just continue. We can just and you can download the lecture and watch it another time. All right, all right. I'll see you on uh, Wednesday because I just want to tell you that quickly. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are you going to do right now? Everyone's gone? I'm sorry. Do what? After this, we create the object OF stream. Right, and then you're going to need um, the if stream and OF stream in file, out file. Okay. From there, I have now the file open. Now what? Could I just go ahead and just send things to it? You're gonna have to out file uh, whatever you want to say, and then whatever um, variable you want to out file. So it'd be like, see out. You sold this many, or you sold tickets this many or something like that. Kind of like, I, 
the same thing that you do with the CL, but you're just going to put the output file in place. I'm going to build it. Even though this information is still displayed on um, the monitor, I kept it there. But now if I go to my project, There it is, right there. However, we have one, we have two problems. What do you think they are? Um, well, if you don't know the file name, you're going to have to have the user input that file name. Well, I said their file name was right there, so I. I know. And on the lab, you also know the out, the output file. So you don't have a validation for the uh, opening of that file. Very good. So how would I want to put that validation in? Uh, probably if statement. Go ahead. If, if not out file. Yeah. If not out file, see out your error message else uh, if it is that file then give the prompt the correct error opening, error opening file is that all good enough no and then I, I would do an else uh, just let the user know if if it was the correct file opened just give them a, a message saying that file was created or opened successfully Else. Uh, open successfully. Okay, is that all? Mm -hmm. Do you see another potential problem? It's hard to kind of read your screen. You can't see the screen or? It's just a little fuzzy on my end. It might just be my internet. This one right here is, it's fine that you said it's not open successfully, but this is where our CAD students right here is, you're still writing files to it, file information to it. Even if it's so, not open successfully? Yes, because if open success, if it fails to open successfully, it's going to print this slide out and not this one, but it's still going to continue on with the program. So I would recommend that you would put this stuff in the part of the code where if it's open successfully. Well, open successfully, you probably don't need this, but you can probably put code in. But just be cautious when you prompt the user, tell the user that it did not open successfully, you're not still writing stuff to it. So that's what I wanted to say. For the sake of. You can do it like this, or you can open successfully and just put it right in here. There's other ways of doing it. All right. You can do it multiple ways. You can say instead of doing not open successfully, if it's open successfully, put all your code in here, and then else saying it failed. There's multiple ways um, to write it, and I'm not going to grade you on how you do it. I just wanted to make you be cautious on it the way we did before, that if this was outside those if else statements, you were either way, if it was open successfully or it's not, you're still writing data to it. So be careful on where you write your um, so data. It, I thought I thought you could only write data if the file was open. So if the file is not open, how is it writing data to it? It's you're still going to try to write for to it. Okay. So for example, so you're pretty much just saying it's just code being wasted. 
It could, and it's going to gen probably generate error message because you're saying write to this file, and the program's going to say, I have errors. I'm trying to write to the file. So it could throw exceptions and error handling that you do not know of fact because you are trying to write to a file that did not open. If that makes sense. You're still, even though yeah. you have a user, you still have code in it that's still executing. Yeah. So yeah, be that careful sense. on that. Be careful on that. Uh, and also, we're missing another thing. What else are we missing? You didn't close the file? Very good. How do we close it? Simple. It's a close functionality. Any other questions from now that we handled a while loop and a while loop and now we ha handle file processing. So we handled two topics that we covered in the chapter. I was going to do more with this in lab, but I'll wait for we to do it in chapter six. I was going to put this whole program in a loop to say, would you like to do it again? But for the sake of time, we'll do that next in lab. Uh, I have a question. Uh huh. How do you put? Um, how would you? So you know when you when you're making the file right revenue dot dot txt. What if you want to make the file name a variable and input it? How would you put that into the code? You can probably just put in the string name. String file name. <laughs> And then you can pass that inside here. You can read it in as a variable. What? There you go. But you would ha you would prompt the user for a CN, and you'd read in that file name. Does that make sense? So I don't need to put like a .txt or something. What it. You can have the user type txt, or you could take the file name and then file name. Remember, we talked about the appending operator. Remember those? Yes. Is could you do? Could you also do that? Like, I mean, file name then put instead of putting up put it in the same line when you create it. So the file name, and then you put in parentheses uh, t .txt. Say that one more time. So like instead of the, so what you're doing on line 59 is you're taking the file name, adding txt. Could you put uh, out for line 60, output file .open, and then in the parentheses, the file name plus like a. Do like this. I should do it like this. Because you have to append it back. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll put, I mean, on line 60, could you put output file dot open and then the file name and then you put in, in the parentheses dot txt? Would that work? You would have to append it to it. Dot txt. I don't know. You, you would say put, how would you say, if I'm right here, how would you say to do it? Just do dot txt? Like that adding. Yeah, like I want to put .txt within that without putting it on a separate line. Okay, so you want to take the file name, file open. Do, do, do. Why don't you just do like something like this? You can play around with it. Because now you have the username with the file name. Then you have open, and you sign it back to a TXT, and then you open up all in one line. OK, that makes sense. But that's not, that is not a requirement for this lab, you know, in lab three. You do know that. You, you do know that. For your lab three, you do not need to specify or read in uh, Name for the report. Oh, um, yeah. I was just uh, I was just asking about mainly question about how it treats different types of data within 
like within the parentheses. Yes, you could. This is a good idea where you could start practicing with it. This is this is the way you get comfortable with how the code handles by practice. If you have an idea, you have a compiler right there. Demonstrate it, try to see if you, what you could do. There's more than one way to write it. All right, any other questions? All right, I'll fix this up and post it on Blackboard. Um, so I keep track because I lost it the first time when I got disconnected. Anything else regarding this in lab? Because remember what well, next um, chapter is functions. So you can think of all these different types of functions we're going to write with this. And we're starting that Wednesday? Uh, what's today? 28? 28 right there. Yes. On Wednesday. Chapter 5 and then chapter 6. So, yes. Let's go with the review. Um, quarter lectures. TCC. This is not working very good. Okay. Let's start with the true false first. Then just shout out the answers. Can everyone see this questions right here? Yep. I can see if I can make it a little bigger if you need it. Um, 47, the operand of the increment decrement operators can be any valid mathematical expression. True or false? True. True. Think about it. Let me see if someone's beeping in so I can see the questions right here. Yeah, he said false. All right. Whoever said false, congratulations. It is false because remember, it has to be a variable. It has to have an address. A mathematical expression could be x plus y. And you can increment the summation on that one. So no, it cannot be any mathematical expression. The 48, the C out statement in the fallen program segment will display a 5. True. That's, I think that's false. False. Why would that be false? Doesn't it add to? Doesn't it add? Or add one? But what is that? Is that pre or post? Remember I says it all depends on the expression. If this is post, it says evaluate the line first and then increment the number. So in this case, it's going to display five. And then it's going to increment on the after the next line saying, now x is 6. So that is true. Ah, uh, OK. Remember, I had those slides that say pre and post. If they're on the same line, if they're on the line all by themselves with nothing else on it, they are the same. But if they are on the line with anything else, anything, it depends if it's pre or post. If it's post in this case, that means Evaluate the line first with the value that it is right now, and then increment me or decrement me after. Make sense? Yeah, so the next line would it would add one after that. Is, is that right? Yeah, 
uh, after after it executes this line and displays a five, then X will be incremented to a six. Okay. Yeah. Now with this one, the CL statement, the following expression program will display a five. True or false? No, that one's false. False. Okay. Why? Why? Someone explain to me that in that now. Why is this one false? Because it's adding one. The plus plus is before the x, so it's adding one. When you say before, let's start talking the lingo like we know okay. what we're talking about. Okay. When it's before, what do we call that? Pre. 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 Pre increment. Pre let's start talking the lingo. Let's start talking. Okay. Lingo. Okay. The while loop is a pretest loop. True. 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 The do while loop is a pretest loop. False. False. The for loop is a post test loop. False. That is correct. 53. It is not necessary to initialize counters. It is not necessary to initialize counter variable. False. False. You should initialize counter variable. All three of the for loop expressions may be omitted. We talked about this in lecture. Uh, false. That's true. actually that's actually true. You still you have to put those sections somewhere else, but in the actual for loop, you can specify them somewhere else so they can be blank, but they're listed somewhere else. Wait, so you standards. Mean, hmm. you just do it? Wait, so you're saying the uh, all three of the four four loops can maybe a minute is meaning like you can skip over them as a no you, you still need to have um I still have visual. on your for loop you would still have the four section so you'd have semicolon here semicolon here semicolon here and inside here you'd have code but this initialization part would be defined somewhere else The, the increment, the update variable that you would have to be listed somewhere else. So you can still have all these blank and so forth, and it would still work. It's not good programming style at all, but you can specify them somewhere else. Okay. It's not good doing it that way, but it's just you can. Um, and if you have an electronic copy of the book, well, I don't know what it is, but it was actually specified in the hard copy of the book. I don't know if it's in the actual, um, in the version nine book that I have, um, it was actually specified like on a page 259, but it was actually mentioned in the actual book. 55, one of the Limitations of the for loop is that one variable may be initialized in the initialization expression. Okay. True. Mm, no. You, it's not an initialization. It's not a limitation. It's because you can specify multiple initializations. You just have to have a comma. Yeah, but don't you have to have one, at least one? One limitation of the for loop is that only one variable may be initialized in the initialization chain. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. Uh, 57, 56. The variables may be defined inside the body of a loop. Variables may be defined inside a body of a loop. True. True. It, that is true. But be careful that if you, if, you initialize, if you define them inside the loop, in the body of the loop, the scope is only in the loop. They will not be seen outside. 
57, a variable may be defined in the initialization expression of the for loop. True. True or false? 57, a variable may be defined in it. Yes. True. In a nested loop, the outer loop executes faster than the inner loop. False. In a nested loop, the inner loop goes through all iterations for every single iteration of an outer loop. True. True. 60. To calculate the number of iterations of a nested loop, add the iterations of all the loops. False. Correct. 61. The break statement causes a loop to stop the current iteration and begin the next one. False. False. I mean, wouldn't it go back to the beginning? Okay. No. A break breaks you out of the current loop that you're in. So it's false. The continuing statement causes a terminated loop to resume. False. False. In a nested loop, the break statement interrupts the loop it is placed in. True. When you call an OFTREAM object member function, the specified file will be erased if it already exists. True. 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 Instead of going all through these questions, let me see who's... Um, Does everyone that's on this phone right now have access um, to the speaker? Guys, Hussein, John, Michael, and who don't yeah. you all? Yes. Speaker, yeah. All right. So, who though? Right. Tell me all you know about a while loop. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you know about a while loop and how it works and what you know about it. Tom, can you help them? Oh. Uh, uh, a while loop is. Yeah. A it, it's it's like a it tests for a specific uh, if something is true or false and then if it if it is if it is uh, true depending on what you place within the parentheses it'll uh, continue going on it'll continue going through the code that's within the loop and then once it becomes false it goes it breaks out. So, what, so, what, so is it a pretest or a post-test? Uh, pretest. Pre, yeah. With that being said, what is the minimal number of times that Luke can execute? None. Zero. Zero. And what's the maximum number of times? Infinite. 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 Right. John, tell me about a for loop. A for loop? Yes. This is, this is good for you because this is, helps you understand. If you can explain it, then you should understand the concept of it. So explain to me a for loop. A for loop is, is that, is that the, the post one or? Or is that, that the other pre one? I can't remember. You tell me which, what 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 is the for loop? You think it's pre or post? Mm, for loop is. Let's see. I think the while is pre, and so the 
I think it's another. It's the other pre one, isn't it? Yeah. The four, the pre. Okay, keep going. Okay. Um, isn't that the one where it it kind of tells you how many times the loop needs to go? Yeah, yeah on the right track, it's usually used when you know the, the size. Yes. Yeah, you know how many times you have to do it, yeah. So it's a pre it's a pre check. It's right. a loop that continues where I know a finite size, but for the minimal number of times that it could execute is how many? It's probably zero. Zero. And yeah. what's the maximum? The maximum? It, if you're defining how many it is, shouldn't it be what you, you know, how many you set it to be? Yes, it should be, but yes. But it also, if you don't exit it correctly or increment, it could be infinity. But yes, it okay. should be up to the number of elements in it or. Um, or infinity. Yes. Um, well, Gary, do, what does it do while? Michael. Which one? A do while. Explain to me a do while. Uh, it's the post the post test loop that we have. Yeah, it's usually this. It's a statement. Ow. It's the Go state. <laughs> Sorry, cat's going nuts. It's the statement before um, before the expression. For the expression. Right. So it's gonna it's gonna um, give you the statement and then the expression. If the expression expression is found to be true, it's gonna repeat. If it's false, it'll break out. And so, what's the minimal times that it can be executed? The minimal is zero. No. No. A do while is a post test. Oh, so, so it's going to be one time then. One time in the match. In the max. Uh, it's whatever the. Isn't it whatever the user sets it or you set it to be? It, it's a while loop, so it can be infinity. So let's see if there's any other questions that are possibly good. Let me see. Describe the difference between a pre and post test. You already did. Everyone explain that to me. So if, um, Hunter, explain to me this one. Why is the difference? Uh, what are the why are the statements in the body of a loop called condition, conditionally executed statements? Because there's a, a, con, a certain condition that has to be met for them to be executed. Very good. Um, Hassan, what header file do we need to include in a program that performs the file operation? Right. Are you talking about the hashtag include? Yes. Yeah, pre -process. Um, F, F stream? F stream. John, that was, explain to me what a break statement does. It uh, breaks the current uh, the current loop you're in and starts it back at the, the beginning. Is that correct? You got the first part thing. Just take, leave that in. It only breaks the current loop that you're in. It doesn't go back and retest it, but if you have a nested loop within the loop, then um, it only breaks the, the loop that you're in. Oh, okay. okay. If so you if, you, to, if you put it in the in the inside of the in, the inner loop of your nested loop and you break that, it's going to go back to the outer loop and continue going through. Right break. Now, like if you go right here and this like, for loop like right here, if I put a break here, it's still going to go. It's just going to break me out of this loop, but I'm still inside this loop. So the outer loop right. can continue to go, and then you can eventually end back up in that same exact inner loop. 
Yes, because remember, in this for loop, it's going to go through all iterations. The inner loop is going to go through all iterate iterations of the outer loop. So, yes. But I'm just wanting to demonstrate that the break only breaks you out of this loop, but not the outer loop. Only the current loop that you're executing. Very good. Uh, who, who answered that one? Was that John? Yeah. And then Michael, explain to me the continue. What is, explain to me what the continue does. Does it? Are you, did you call me? Um, Michael. Michael. Yes. Uh, it'll go to the end of the loop um, to prepare for the next one. If I had to continue here, it's going to go and go reevaluate the loop that I'm in. Go reevaluate my expressions. All right. Let's see if go covered everything. Make sure you are very comfortable with your pre and post. Make sure you're very comfortable whether it's pre or post and how they work. Know that they cannot be used like with this, any expression. So you know that can it work. You could use increment of a variable, but you cannot do it as a mathematical expression. Um, you cover the looping. You, you explain to me what the um, for loop, do while, and um, for while, do while, and so you know how they work. Know what a counter is. Counter helps keep track of the number of iterations it goes through. That's what I do while. For loop. You can you have multiple initializations and multiple tests, just followed by comma. Running total. Oh, here's a good one. Um, let me see who is in the class. Someone explain to me what a sentinel is. It's used for a user to enter a certain character or number to break out of that loop. Very good. And it's not used part of it. Well, this slide, whether um, how it's purpose of each loop. Um, we talked about file processing. You know this, but it's not going to be quiz on, but just know it for your future that if you ever see it, you may need to use the C string operator. Um, and then also, no scope. Um, let me go back to Visual Studio. If I have, let's take this off. We need to find your variable. It's an integer y here. Y is equal to 10. Zero, zero. Y is less than. And why is it going to? When you initialize your for loop right here, this y is only used within this for loop. I cannot use it outside because of scope of it. So, so if a user defines that variable inside of a for loop, you could still use that outside of it, correct? Like if you, like let's say you wanted the user to input the file name or um, I don't know number of tickets they sold, and then outside of it you put tickets equal tickets inside that loop. Could you still use it outside of that? Say that. Let, 
Um, I'm sense. not sure the question. Let me um, let me you repeat that one more time. But but like on this variable right here, since it's defined outside, I can use it inside and still see it outside. Okay. But and I can also increment it on the outside to inside this loop. But your question was regarding if you have seats. Yeah, like if I use well, if I just use multiple for statements, but I wanted like uh, I wanted to use that variable that the that the user generated in the next for statement. Could I still do that? If that makes sense, I might not be quick. Yeah, I'm not quite. I'm understanding the definition. So if I have another for loop, tell me what you want in the outer for loop and what you want in the inner for loop. Like. If, if I'm trying to get the, the number of tickets for something, so and I have, are, yeah, the ticket C, okay, yeah, and then I want to I want to get the price for tickets Z in the next for loop or something, something like that. Could I still use that initiated variable that the user entered in the next for loop? On this one, because yes, because the scope of it is here to here. And that's okay. including. However, once this out of for loop ends, it's gone. Okay. So if you want to use stuff that's in multiple for loops, I would recommend pulling that information out because that way you have that information. Yeah, um, that's what I was asking. So you can pull it out of that for loop and then continue to use it in the for loop. Yes. Okay. That's what I did with X here. I have X on the outside, and I can still use X on the inside. And I can still increment this and so forth. But I cannot do the same thing for Y because Y on this end is initialized just for this for loop right here. Okay. The way well, it you is, do, if it's, you can do the same thing for y at the end too, right? You can just redefine it outside the variable or outside the for loop. I, I, I can do another. I can do another int y here, yes. But I lose that information. But if I wanted to use y in both places, I could do this integer y out on the outside here and have it ten, and I can always initialize it to y here. And now I have access to it on both inside and outside. Okay. But the whole point of is I want you to get idea with what we call scope. Where I define my variable, it's from that closing parentheses, opening parentheses, the closing parentheses, that's the life cycle of that variable. So once it ends, integer C. Once this, once this block is over, this is no longer in memory. It's gone. So the life cycle of this, and that's going to become very big in the next chapter. But it's and they're talking about it here as well, so I want you to be familiar with it. So any other questions that we talked about? We talked about file processing, um, file processing, looping. And we call increment, decrement, pre and post. So be familiar with all of that information. So any questions or concerns over this chapter? Not me. Any other questions regarding your labs? Yeah, I have one, but I can wait till you're done with everything. All right, let me stop recording. Were you the one that emailed me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I know someone did. I was trying to get on earlier so we can get a session going, but I guess TCC 